What's up and welcome back to Gabe Miller Music. Today I'm digging into the use of the Akai Force as a primary production station. I alluded to the possibility of being able to just have it live on my desk and use it as my main music production platform in a previous video and today I want to explore that a bit. So to do that I'm going to be walking you through the beat that you heard in the intro. The full version of it is linked at the end of this video which I performed live in one take and I'm going to use that to bring up a bunch of different aspects of using the Akai Force as a primary production device, show you what my experience was, and hopefully give you some thoughts to leave the video with. So first of all, a fun aspect of this, unlike my normal Akai Force stuff where I make the entire instrumental on the device and then get a vocalist later, the vocals were already on the device. And I've got those loaded into an audio track with the different clips laid out. The clips work a little bit weird and it still kind of mystifies me at points, but I did get it to work pretty damn smoothly. I do want to mention that I time stretched the vocals just by 10 BPM from 140 to 150. And this is my first kind of pro tip that I wish someone had told me earlier. Don't use the real time warping on the force for something that you want to sound good, use uh, warping that gets it baked in to the track. So here are my vocal clips. This basically works like a glorified drum program thing. Standing, falling. If I go into sample edit and process, you can choose a bunch of different ways to more permanently process the sample. This won't apply to the way the sample is stored on the memory card, but it'll apply to the sample as a whole, get baked into that audio within your project. So you can go to time stretch and you can choose the original BPM and what BPM you're changing it to. This sounds a lot better than the live like on the fly warping. So I wanted to put that up front. The reason, by the way, that I had a vocal just locked and loaded, ready to go already on the force is kind of interesting. So this will be a very brief tangent. You can skip it if you want. But uh, one way that vocalists and producers work is that the producer makes an instrumental, sends it to a vocalist, and then the vocalist writes something over the top of it. The other way is that the vocalist will send a vocal to a producer and the producer will build an instrumental around it. But if like me, you're a bedroom producer with not really any industry connections, you don't have access to either of those channels. So usually I'll have to use my mediocre vocal writing abilities and then get a vocalist to bring that to life. In this case, I actually found a website and this is not an ad read. I have no affiliation with them that allows vocalists to sell vocal tracks and then producers can buy a license to that vocal track and build a song around it. So that's what I did in this case. I'm going to link the YouTube channel of the fantastic vocalist in the description, as well as her page on that site. I recommend giving her a follow. I'll probably work with her vocals again. And I just thought this was kind of an interesting find, an interesting way to approach making music, because sometimes I want to just do production, even if I don't already have a song idea. So this is basically like doing a remix in a sense. So the goal here was to make a song on this thing that is basically the exact same result as it would be if I started with that vocal and built an instrumental around it in my DAW. I think I got pretty close, but it had some interesting both pros and cons that I'll get into. But first, let's just get into uh, a bunch of the layers that are in the main melodic drop, and then we'll get more into uh, constructing a full song. So we've got... drums with many different snares that get used at different points and then uh, various bits of percussion, hi-hats. Vocal. And I'm going to leave the drums going for context. This lead, by the way, is from my $5 key group pack for both the MPCs and the Force, linked in the description, helps keep the channel going, sampled from my Roland JU-06A. And I have another key group program also from my JU-06A layered on top of it. So together. A lot of shimmer.
Here, those are side chains of the kick and snare. So here's a quick first takeaway. Uh, you will hit your plug-in limit on the force fairly quickly if you like to layer a lot. I didn't hit mine, but that's because I was being very careful not to. So using key group programs can go a long way because they're pretty powerful and can often sound really nice if they're sampled from good source material, especially if they're multi-sampled from good source material. And the native built-in synth plugins in the force, especially hype, they're fine, but they can sound a little cheap and a little generic in my opinion. So using key group programs that sampled some patches that I designed myself that I think sound really nice went a long way towards giving this whole track not only an extra veneer of professionalism, but something much closer to my own sound. Something kind of 80s inspired and shimmery, but still clean. Obviously, because I'm selling these sounds in a pack, I have a bit of conflict of interest in saying that, but I say this mostly just to say I used my own patches and therefore brought my own sound through, which is kind of obvious. But let's keep the layers going. We've got two base layers. the saw bass and the growls. So the growls are in a drum program. These are all one shots. Every single bass growl and hit you hear are all sampled. So that's another thing that is different from how I would do it in a DAW. In a DAW, I know how to design bass growls and like serum and such. So I would probably spend a lot of time doing that. For something more bass heavy, I would absolutely do that. Where like the sound design is the main character of the song, so to speak. In this case, I think using one shots to act as mostly fills and then a fairly percussive drop works pretty well. For those of you who haven't heard it, by the way, here's a quick piece of the uh, bass drop, which is a bit much. So... That uses one shots, which I think some bass music producers might maybe rightfully consider cheating. In this case, I think it works just fine. And I spent a bit of time tuning them. And then some of them are sent to uh, the same mute group to cut each other off. And it's pretty fun how you can create one whole bass growls out of stringing multiple one shots together and then maybe filtering some of them down a bit. So things like that I use as a fill in here. And I filtered this one down in order to really drive that home. That's a total tangent and uh, my voice just cracked. So let's move on. Up next though, let's bring in some big old chord stacks. And we've got a few layers for that. Second layer, something higher up. This did not really need to be fabric, by the way. Kind of overkill. This one's doing a lot of the heavy lifting. But hear what I mean about it sounding a little bit cheap? And it's not all that wide either. So in post, I did some widening because the built-in uh, mod parameter sounds kind of terrible in my opinion. Like it's wide, but it's phasey. And I didn't want that. So I widened it in post instead. So all together. And together with the bass. And just to drive home the fact that this was very much sparked by the vocal. This is just a compositional thing that's kind of fun. I started with that falling bit and then built the melody so that it would weave in and out of it. And literally when I listened to like the original track, I heard this melody and went, 
I have to make this now. It's going to be melodic dubstep. The melody is going to sound like that and the chord progression is going to follow it in thus and such way. And I'm pretty stoked that I was able to actually like bring that into your speakers, especially for something that's live jammable. However, in order to get that to be live jammable, that took some thinking ahead. And this is my next like observation about using the force as your primary production device. In a DAW environment, I would just start throwing tracks around left and right with no regard to how they connect because I can always bridge them one way or another later, either through automation or layering like a crap ton of different elements. In this case, I know I'm going to be somewhat limited in the amount of layers I can use, and I might have to have tracks pull double duty in that they'll have different roles at different points in the song. This is partially because of processing power and partially because I want this to be a manageable thing to perform live, or at least live in studio. I would never try to perform uh, this in an actual live setting. It's way too high risk, low reward. But uh, in a live in studio where I have unlimited takes, that's just fine. And hey, to toot my own horn a little bit in the final version that's linked at the end of this video, after a few false starts, I then had what I call the God run where I just went through the entire thing in my first full take flawlessly. Regardless, I started just by making this drop which is evidenced by the fact that the first scene is the drop and I couldn't be bothered to move it. So it's a mixed bag here because on one hand, I need to start immediately thinking about what elements can I add automation to and assign macros to in order to make this manageable for a one take performance. But it's also freaking goaded because copying clips is so easy. And so you can just, you know, use the copy button, boom, boom, you've copied a clip, deleted a clip. So building up a bunch of different sections can be pretty quick as long as you've thought it through first, or else you're going to find yourself doing a bit of backtracking and then forward tracking again. It can be a bit much, but it's really satisfying, especially once you start getting some custom macros involved. So let's jump into the verse. <laughs> So let's quickly introduce a part that we haven't talked about yet, and that's going to be our pluck synth. More use of silence. And uh, this is where I once again am a little conflicted on how to frame this to you, because I am on record saying that a lot of the paid expansion plugins for both the force and the NPCs are overpriced and you should only get them if it fulfills a really specific purpose that you want. I stand by that 1000%. Uh, however, I don't know. I would probably have bought Jura at its full price. It's actually a viable synth to build entire songs around and have it sound nice. I think, in my opinion, I bought it with my own money on sale at that to be very, very clear. But out of all the synths that you can get between like Fabric and stuff like Fabric and Jura are, for me, I, dare I say indispensable? They're close anyway. I could totally get by without them and I absolutely did before they existed, but it elevates this device quite a bit, which I, I hate to say. It's like, hey guys, unfortunately, these plugins are actually pretty good, which means that I can kind of recommend them if they fulfill very specific purposes and if you're in the Akai ecosystem for the long haul, which as I've talked about endlessly before, is a bit of a roller coaster. And I've got a pretty weird bug I encountered that I'll show you in a second. But regardless, it sounds nice. So I have this verse knob here, and this is the first thing that a macro is assigned to with my big old custom macros. Watch the cutoff. So this knob raises the cutoff. And the nice thing, let me go to my macros to show you that, is that you can set the range that you are boxed into. So I have a minimum and a maximum cutoff. So it's guaranteed to sound good all the way at zero and all the way at 100%. So I just have to smoothly raise it from zero to 100 over the course of, say, four bars. That's very intentionally set up. And these knobs are set up to kind of stay out of each other's way. And I'll show you what I mean. So at the start of the song, verse is turned all the way down. But I've also worked this pluck, which ends up sounding a lot more super saw like. 
when the cutoff is open. I've worked this into the intro. So in addition to raising the cutoff, I also raise a filter cutoff on my main saw base, as you probably heard. And bring up its volume. So this starts off with the cutoff of the pluck most of the way down and the bass pretty quiet and in the background. And over the course of the intro, I can slowly bring that energy up and then immediately back off on it when the drums cut out and the vocal kicks in like this. And then we bring in our bass. Falling. I can start to build that up again. That's farther than I would actually do it, but hopefully that shows the ways you have to think ahead and how this device rewards that. So for those of you keeping score, I have the pluck element having its cutoff rise. So it doesn't ever get actually layered with the super saw elements, but it basically takes the place of one of them in order to prepare your ears for the drop. You hear that open saw pulsating chord stack and you're like, oh, I'm going to hear an even bigger one in the drop. And that's exactly what happens. It's very telegraphed. And that's pretty typical for pop EDM and EDM in general. The next thing pulling double duty is that saw bass where it gets filtered down to the point of being basically just a sine wave with some saturation for the intro and the build. The next thing pulling double duty is the lead in the build. I'm going to show you that in a second, though, because let me show you this other thing that this verse knob is doing that I haven't mentioned yet. <laughs> it's lifting the cutoff on that build snare. So it starts off way filtered down with a high cut filter, and then I open that filter up once again over the course of about four bars. Here's where we get to that weird bug I promised I would show you. So I am controlling this through the low pass drum effect. However, every time I load this project, it resets itself to be the default, which is a soft clipper, which was very shocking to me when I had the volume turned way up and I go to bring this down and the snare is just this loud clipped monstrosity. And I had this happen on multiple tracks. So lesson learned, uh, this current version of the firmware really likes resetting the low pass to soft clipper. So in the future, I would use a parametric EQ or filter on one of the inserts. That's just a weird thing that I noticed. And it's things like that that always give me a bit of hesitancy in recommending Akai products, period. Stuff like this happens all the friggin' time. Regardless, uh, once we've gotten to our second half of the build, we get to our second macro, which is the build knob. And this I can show you basically cuts lows on a bunch of stuff and then tunes the snare drum up over time. So let me just demonstrate this whole thing. So the idea is once I've got this knob all the way at 100, I move on to the build knob second. <laughs> Gotta make sure I get it to 100. Hey, scroll. and we go into our drop. And by the time that both of these knobs are at 100, all of the drop stuff has been brought to its full strength, if you will. The other element that's pulling a bit of double duty, by the way, is my Jura lead. The build knob is filtering it down a bit. Just with a parametric EQ high cut filter. So I have set up the range of this cutoff specifically so that around here is where you first hear this synth. So it's brought in really smoothly just in time for the full drop to kick in. So then to get to the second build and the second drop, I have to basically tear a bunch of that down and build it back up quickly on the fly, which took a bit of doing. This knob for the rest of the song stays at 100. That doesn't change. But at the very end of the big chord stack melodic drop, the one that you heard in the intro, I take both of these knobs and bring them down over the course of like a bar. So I've got a very filtered down copied clip of that bass pattern, and it's being controlled by this bass knob here. 
basically just a bunch of highs and lows cut within a specified range again. So I can raise this over time once again to very heavily telegraph the bass drop. And then turn both knobs at once like a real DJ. And here's where the force led me to discovering the ability to do one of the funniest things I think I've ever done. So I have this piano part. This just plays like the main chord progression melody. And that goes at the end as a nice little wind down. And ah, oh, isn't that pretty? And that's with fabric. It sounds nice. So when I was kind of testing out that build to bass drop, I hit the wrong button. Then I spent approximately 10 minutes in my room alone cackling to myself and I went, I have to. So in the final song, that is there as like a fake out, well, a double fake out drop. And fortunately, uh, the vocalist of this has heard it and took it, it not as mockery, but took it in the spirit that it was intended as just a ridiculous over the top moment. Uh, I just think that's fun. And if it weren't for hitting the wrong button while testing it out, I wouldn't have committed to that bit. But I was like, this is just way too funny to me to not do in the final drop. And then it was all about just trying to make sure it was seen as intentional instead of a mistake because it was intentional. And it's worth mentioning that once this full bass drop has been brought in, I can cut to the melodic bit as like a break from it here. And these knobs are already parked at 100% all the way open, so I can go back to our melodic drop again, because I've earned a repetition of it, I think. It makes its triumphant comeback, we play that piano part, the song ends. So, there are only two things left to do. First, do some problem solving to get myself a cleaner intro, and then actually perform the thing. So, this is an interesting bit of problem solving. So my intro is this. And that's nice. And in the DAW, I think this would be trivially easy to do. On this, it's mostly trivially easy, but took, a, once again, a, just a bit of problem solving. So what I did was I went to my master track and my mixer, and I put reverb, just a giant freaking reverb, at 100% wet on the master. And then I recorded my master just resampled that entire thing. I basically just hit play on the intro and then stopped it after only one hit of the chords had played and let that uh, vocal uh, ring out. Then having sampled that, I brought it into a drum track, reversed it, and then just moved around the bounds of my sampled clip of that reversed sound so that it created this really nice swell. And honestly, that would be easier in a DAW. I do want to take this moment to acknowledge that building up a track in this way is slightly psychotic, and it takes someone whose brain is uniquely broken to do that. A lot of you fit that definition along with me, so you're complicit in this. And other than probably genre, because I'm over here making pop EDM, you and I are probably pretty similar in the way that our brains are broken but it allowed me to make a nice video out of it and it was reasonably fun and hands-on and I ended up making this song in bits and pieces during one of the busiest weeks in the past few years of work and studying for professional exams and whatnot. So doing it in a hands-on way and applying some creative problem solving in order to make that happen uh, is something that I don't know that I would recommend to most people, but I had fun. And finally, we record all of that with automation right turned on, very important, 
into the arranger and it looks like this monstrosity and then i didn't edit any of this after the fact i got what i wanted so i exported those individual tracks mixed them in post and did things like uh, a bit of eq to resolve some frequency masking between the lead and the super saw chords for instance i widened out the super saw chords i did a bunch of meticulous referencing to some other melodic dubstep tracks in order to make sure that this sounded as comparable to a pro track as possible that I think was worth it. The differences are not crazy obvious, but when they all stack, they become obvious. And if you'd like to hear what that fully mixed and mastered version sounds like, you can check out this video up over here. And if you'd like to see a more generalized review type video and comparison to some other workstation-y type stuff, you can check out this video down over here. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll be back with a new video in a little bit. Brush this aside a little bit, because it's easy in my face. It's in my eye. My hair's in my face and it hurts.